Um, so are we. So am I. So, um, this here. Uh, one, it's good to see everyone. To the fathers out there, happy belated Father's Day. Uh, this process has been um, a really fun and energizing one. And our group has done a terrific job, not just recently, but dating all the way back to when a lot of these players for the draft have been in high school, not just as seniors, but as juniors. So it's really cool to see their evolution uh, and how far they've come and just the positions that they put themselves in and for us to be here and uh, get a chance to see them live and in person and getting to know them through interviews and through just intel assignments has been really, really interesting. Um, but at the same time, there is a great energy around this group for where we're at currently and uh, what we want to continuously do here in Atlanta. So uh, couldn't be more proud of the group, um, the support that we've had from top down. Uh, to continue on in this process of, of building out things. So, um, so we'll, we're about, what, a week away? Mm -hmm. Week and a half away? So we'll, we'll continue on, but we've definitely gotten closer and uh, further down the line. So we'll be ready next week for the two days. So with that, I'll open it up. So just touching on, you talked about the interviews and getting to know these players. I know discretion has kind of been a big thing for you guys this year, but yeah. what has been kind of a common thread with some of the prospects that you guys have been able to bring in? Common thread has, has really been about fit. Um, it's been, I, through this past year, year and a half, really nailing down some characteristics that are important to us. Um, now, it doesn't necessitate that every single player is gonna fit every single one. I mean, like, that's, that's, a, that's a tall task for anybody. Um, but using that as a guiding light and uh, understanding like the who and the ethos that we want to build mm -hmm. around here um, and it's a continuous process like I'll probably always be here saying like we're building and it doesn't matter where we're at from a wins and losses perspective mm -hmm. um, but that's been the common thread is just looking at every individual and weighing it against some of these ideals you could say and uh, and how they fit for us going into the future. What has jumped out about some of those guys as far as the ethos and who they are? And yeah, um, they're actually just really like good guys, like good people um, in this draft. And it doesn't mean like it's not always like that, right. but it really has been neat to kind of see, especially the guys that are all projected to be at the top and guys that we've had in, you know, taking them to dinner and speaking with them, whether it's in Chicago, mm -hmm. here in the building, uh, on Zoom, elsewhere. I mean, like we've had so many different mediums to do this, and just just to get to know them more and more outside of just the intel that you gather around them. Um, it's just some really good guys. How many guys are we talking about? Quite a few. You have a number? Nope. <laughs> um, how locked How locked in is your board, and what would it take for a player <clears throat> maybe to jump play rate right at number one? Yeah, it's a good question. I would say a week ago it was wider than it is now. Um, the board is definitely shaping up, uh, tearing itself out. So. Uh, in order to be number one, he's just the guy that we see is a great fit for us, not just for the next day, but for the future as well. How busy is your phone, and when do you expect that to continue to ring? Is it, in, in your experience, is it day before, because you guys haven't had a number one, you don't know, don't know what you don't know? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely been ringing. I got a little time off yesterday because it was Father's Day, but uh, for the most part, um, it continuously rings, and you know we make outgoing calls as well just to see what the rest of the, the landscape is looking like. You're talking about fit and characteristics. What yeah. are some of those? I know you're not gonna give us a blueprint, but yeah. overall, what are some of the things that you wanna see stand out when you're talking <clears throat> to some of these players? Yeah, for sure. Um, unselfishness is one that is pretty high for us. And it doesn't always mean like completely bypassing everything you do. Uh, when we talk about humility, it's just about the, the ability to own the gold and the dirt. Um, and just kind of living into that more and more. Quinn's talked a lot about competing and competing at a high level. Uh, just your everyday grind um, in every possession over the course of a game, like those should matter to you. Like that's competing. Uh, being connected, unity is another big piece. Like so those two merging together. Uh, and finally like perseverance or like a grittiness. It's a long season, and there's gonna be ups and downs. So who are you when pressure starts to level up? Like that's who we wanna see um, these players become and what they're going to look like during that process. But those would be some core ones, I would say. What's, well, the, one, oh, what's the collaboration process between you guys in the front office and Quinn and what he's looking forward to add to the court? Hi, highly collaborative. Um, it's, I, me personally, I enjoy hearing different perspectives. Your vantage points can be different than mine. So how do you see this? Uh, 
can we take those and then put them together and make the best informed decision as possible? And so that's not just with our front office, but that's with our coaches as well. What, what about a fit as far as DeJounte and Trey is concerned? Is that in, in, in the mix at all, or are you thinking in those terms? Yeah, you always, it doesn't matter if it's Trey, DeJounte, Bogey, B, like anybody that's on our roster, like all comes within any fit analysis and whatnot. So uh, it's not just two guys. Have any of the current players, speaking on Trey and DJ, have they set in on any of the workouts or gave you guys any feedback on what they potentially see fitting with the roster? If there's anybody you know, in the gym, this is their home um, during one of our workouts, then yeah, absolutely. They're more than welcome to stay and join and watch. Um, but if they're here, they're here. You only have one pick in this draft. How does that factor into decisions you must make on some of these phone calls as to what you do with number one and whether it makes sense to trade for more picks? Um, I think there's more to that than just having one. I mean, it's just looking at where are we at from a roster standpoint, how many roster spots do we project to have available, uh, all seeps into that. The new cap environment is a big thing too. You know, it's how you're spending your money is definitely gonna add or hinder you from a roster building perspective. So uh, all factors into it for sure. If I can follow up, you spoke of having tiers. That doesn't mean you, you have them all on one same peg, but you have to, uh, do you have to have a clear idea in your mind that there is an unquestioned number one? Sorry, what do you mean? Do you have to have it clear in your mind that there's a clear number one and he's just not just part of a tier where a lot of uh, several players are on the same level? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, eventually you'll, you'll narrow it down to your guy. Sure. Because there's not a, a victor in this draft, there's the narrative that it's a down draft. Is that a lazy take that the talent in this draft is not comparable to years past because there's not a uh, known name, so to speak, out there? Um, is it a lazy take? I, I don't know. I, we're in a great position to really do deep dives. I think we're really excited by the draft. And the more that we uncover, like we go, great, I'm glad we have number one. I keep joking around like I'm not giving it back. So um, I think we're in a really good position here. I, I'm excited about it, frankly. It's been a little over a month since uh, the team announced Auntie Sala coming on and joining the front office. Yeah. What does he bring to the table, and why did you find it necessary to, to add another voice in the room as an assistant GM? I, I, people that want good people, and they fit a lot of the culture that we're building here, uh, is always going to be a great thing for us. Uh, I knew Auntie back when I was working with San Antonio, so to watch his progression from there to Golden State and a lot of strategy and uh, just his viewpoint on basketball was gonna be great for our group to add. So putting him in a position to lead more, um, just felt like the right move for him in his own development. And he's been great with us so far. Like he's really been fantastic. I know it might not be a fair comparison because the NFL has so many more picks and so many more players on the roster, but yeah. you talk to teams and they look for a quarterback, they'll bring in eight quarterbacks and they'll ask them questions like in the red zone, specifically, what's your favorite play? And they get that intel. So if they don't you know, play him down the road, whether it's a year or two years down the road, they might be in the red zone and this is the guy we like and remember. Is there something you can do when you bring guys in, like those types of questions, either it's favorite moves, favorite plays, where you're, you bottle that information and save it for down the road? Um, I have to look. Present that question a different way. What do you mean? Well, I just you know when we when you talk to these guys, you I mean you could have you know five guards in there. You might not you know, you're not definitely not looking to draft guards two, three, and four, five. But you're looking for a nugget, some uh -huh. information when they maybe become a free agent down the road. Uh, those type Got of things, like the inside baseball stuff that you have the opportunity to shelve it and use that content or not content, but that yeah. those nuggets down the road. Got it. Totally understand. Um, no, it's a good question. It, yeah, like the more information that we have, like the better. Um, to kind of look back to with whatever information we have today and weigh it against any future decisions when we get there. It's just nice to just kind of see how things evolve for certain players over time, for sure. What's the hardest part of this entire process? Like in your perspective, obviously a lot of us have never been in your shoes going through this yeah. process. What's the hardest part? What's the hardest part about this process? There's always challenges. Um, I think really it comes down to when you have X number of players, you know, you look at them, you're like, you can make a case for him, you can make a case for him, make a case for him. Like, where do you finally like nail it down? Um, it's a challenge in a sense that it's just like, oh, here, here's the guy, you know, but it really it's, it's, it's an opportunity, especially for our group on how we are um, continuously being uh, collaborative in our process. So. It's hard to say like there's like the hardest thing where I like sit here and go like, oh, I'm really dreading that. Uh, there's nothing like that. Um, it's just 
presents its challenges. New data com comes in. So how are you weighing that against things that you've already learned? Have you learned something about you guys as a unit of how you're able to collaborate and communicate? Like, is there something that's come up where you're like, wow, we're really strong in this area or something along those lines? Uh, we love basketball. <laughs> I would really say that. And I don't mean to say that like in a joking manner. Like, they're, it, like, it's hard to say, well, work ended at five and that's it. You know, like, we have a bunch of communication, whether it's through watching playoff basketball or just things that come up or there's a random idea. Uh, I think that's what's really neat about our group is just the love that we have for the craft of it. Landry, there's as much of an opportunity as the number one pick is. Um, I think you just look at history that hasn't always panned out, you know, for teams that have used it. And I'm curious, is there wisdom in trading back just so you can get more chances and hopefully getting, you know, one of these picks pans out? Yeah, so we as a group, we've looked at a ton of different scenarios. Like, keep the pick, you try to get back into the draft, you move back, all the things that you're talking about. And with where we're at right now, like we'll pick one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it would be, I don't think it would be wise for us not to like go over those scenarios, but there's been a ton that we've gone over and we'll continuously go over those as well. Even ones that, you know, may present later on with you know, different team talks that we've had. You say you're pretty committed to using, to, to not to keeping it? Yeah, so today, like we're planning on picking one. As Following the draft, of course, the uh, summer league play will take place in two weeks down the line. Would it be any ex expectation with whoever you guys take with that pick to play in summer league ball? And have you had any commitment so far from some of the younger players, Kobe and such? Yeah, so, um, yeah, a few of our guys currently will play summer league. Mo, Kobe, uh, we have Dylan Willow on a two-way, so he'll play with us as well, although he's becoming a free agent. But, yeah, the expectation is whoever we draft will play in summer league. As far as who you've had in for workouts, sorry to go back to that, but has yeah. anyone blown you away that you're just kind of like, that's very close to being the guy that we want? A few different guys, yes. <laughs> how do you uh, kind of, <laughs> on that, along that line, how do you sort of integrate what happens in an individual or a one-on-one -on -one workout versus what you see on film over a very large sample size? Yeah, uh, I like that question because a guy can come in here and not be great, and I still would make sure our group is really looking at the whole picture. Mm -hmm. And we have so many different assessment tools for us that it doesn't come down to 45 minutes to an hour of a workout. Um, but it's helpful. It's always just nice to kind of feel their energy amongst the rest of the group in the front office and the coaches and whatever players are here. Um, so it's a nice piece of data, but it doesn't come down to just that. A lot of these top guys are international prospects and everything like that, playing in France, Australia, whatever it is. How do you set the hurdle to that coming scouting? It's not as easy as just going down to Duke or North Carolina or whatever it is and talk to a coach like that. Uh, it's really not that much of a hurdle, frankly. It's, you know, as long as you're willing to get on a flight and go see some guys or turn on, you know, some, some medium where you can watch them, uh, it certainly helps. I think it's great because the game has just morphed and evolved to a number of different parts of the world. So, uh, dating back in time, you build out for that, right? Like you have an international scouting group and you consistently bring them into the process and really lean on what they're seeing and what they're hearing out there. And then you, know, you get on a flight and you go see some different players. And how does it change having to see a guy or recruiting, or not recruiting a guy, but you know, scouting a guy who's playing against in a, in a professional league, whether it be in Europe compared to the college team? Yeah, it's, it's <coughs> definitely how are you uh, evaluating the context, right? college, high school, overseas, G League, you know, they're all different contexts. So how can you look at that as a group and then weigh that with the type of player and projecting them out? Like, if it means this in this context, will it mean the same in this one? Questions like that. Uh, it's a good question, though. But how Going back to you know, exit interviews, Trey had said, you know, he wants to win, wants to win here, but he wants to win first. Uh, throughout this offseason, what have those conversations been like with him in, in that regard for his future? Really, it's just been about, you know, one, his development for our future. Like, what are the things that he's going to improve upon? Things that he's going to you know, do the same. Things that are going to help us uh, be at our best. Because just like his opinion is the same as mine. Like, we want to win too, and we want to do it in a way that's not just like a flame. Like, we want to have sustainability here. So, a lot of the fit and uh, me hammering that is really important to that. Does drafting a player number one overall give you the ability to be a win now team? Um. I don't know about that. I think that having number one is is a great position for us. Um, it doesn't really change our landscape too much. It's something that's connected to where we're at, but at the same time, with so many things that change in the NBA at large, you really want to like look at this pick as an opportunity to one find the fit and then find really high upside guys. How do you blend the timeline of the players that you already have on the roster 
with the projected timelines of these guys that you might pick at number one? And how do those projected timelines weigh on your decision? Yeah, it's quite an art form. Um, I think especially with a new cap environment, um, when you bring that into the mix and you're looking at your two year, three year, four year outlook, and of course things change all the time, uh, you're really weighing a lot of that. And it's a constant discussion about where's this guy at in his development, what's the age, what from a contractual standpoint, will he be up extension elbow or free agent? You know, you're, you're constantly having those conversations. Uh, and then you bring in where this pick is at, you know, how does that factor into the mix? So um, I don't think there's anything that's always gonna be perfect, but you definitely wanna try to build out in a way that, that helps you like continuously take wave after wave after wave. Uh, do you plan to bring any more people in? Or are you kind of we ready? do. Okay. I was saying, what's the what's this next week look like for you? A couple more visits, and then what's I guess yep. a, a week in the life of this front office? We are going to have more visits, more phone calls, more conversations. We'll sit as a group, um, as we have done, and really dive deep into every single player. Uh, I think that's what's been really fun about this process is just how deep you can go with with certain guys. Um, and that's probably what our, our week is going to look like until we get closer to the draft where we start to funnel it down to a point. How, how, close, you, how close do you, <laughs> how close do you, would you say you guys are to a final decision? And who's going to make the final, final decision? Uh, we're, we're closer. Uh, there's still some things um, that we're going to look at this week with guys that are coming in uh, and weighing those data points. But we're much closer than we were, say, two weeks ago at the Combine. And ultimately, like, you'll see me raise my hand and say, we'll pick that guy. <laughs> so so you, you, you'll make the final decision? Yes. Okay. Not Tony. It, it'll be you. It, it'll be me. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. I guess to that end, like, how do you feel about the idea that you'll be very, ju you'll be judged very significantly based on how this pick turns out? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, like, it is what it is. Um, so it doesn't really bother me, frankly. Uh, I, I really enjoy our process that we've built out and the people that we've done it with. So like at the end of the day, you will all be the judge of whether that was the right pick or not. For me, it's more looking at where are we at, what was our process, how are we assessing this current player, and just rolling with it. But like, that is really, it is what it is. <laughs> I'm just fortunate to be in this position. Are you sleeping pretty, pretty well? Oh, like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> On less sleep, but like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Landry, has your approach over the years to preparing for the draft changed at all? And like, do you look back to your first draft and how you prepared to now and just how different it is? Yes, yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think it runs parallel and consistent with the words that you'll probably continuously throw up when I keep saying it, about evolution and development, looking at our process and when we get through it on this one, we'll go back and say, okay, how can we get better? What does continuous improvement look like for this process or this player? So I would hope that I would always answer that. And yes, it looks different now. I don't know how much to, to a varying degree, uh, but it just runs consistent with a lot of the words and things that we're preaching here. I know you guys weren't expecting to pick at one. So in this process of having a deep dive on so many different guys and we're expecting to and stuff like that, What's been the biggest, I don't know, surprise or something maybe you didn't expect in having to be in this situation and doing all this deep dive work? Uh, well, the, the pick was definitely a surprise. Those were some odds that you know you obviously could beat because it wasn't zero percent. Uh, but no, we didn't didn't necessarily expect it. But um, I think the biggest surprise outside of that, uh, nothing too surprising. I've more so been encouraged by just kind of how we've gone about it and it kind of puts you in a position too to where you reflect on where you're at and it's nothing that's necessarily changed if we had the first pick the 10th pick it would have been the same process we would have spent hours in that room over there and done deep dives into different players so um, I think it's really cool to honestly kind of see uh, a helpful lens from that perspective on where we're currently at as a group and how we're operating. So just to follow up on that, because the odds were so low to get it, you, you didn't, were you telling your guys, hey, don't waste your time on the picks that could go one through five because we're probably not going to get there, or you throughout the process, like, we got to treat every slot yeah. the same because you just don't know. No, you just don't know. Like, yeah, regardless if it's 3% that you'll have this pick or 95%, all the data points beforehand and the work that does that goes beforehand, like, you have to do to account for this. I don't want to be sitting here one day and be like, oh, we didn't see that player. Like, it's that's, I would 
that makes me cringe think, thinking about that. So, um, no, we'll, we'll, we'll treat every player until somebody says, like, that's not it or we can't do that, um, as if we are going to be able to compete. Because guys, guys fall in the draft, too, right. based off of projections. From a fan's perspective, overall number one picks in this market are kind of rare. And off the top of my head, I'm thinking Chipper Jones and Michael Vick in uh -huh. various sports. And you know, here we are talking about them years later. Is that your hope that whoever you pick is an Atlanta institution and lifts the franchise for a decade or more? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like, make my job a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> With the draft outlook and just how picks kind of stack up next year, the year after, the year after that, how do you avoid sort of the pressure of trying to get this pick right? Uh, I guess kind of tied to that question. Yeah. You avoid the pressure by doing your work. If you do all the right work beforehand and you come to the point of decision, you make the decision and you live with it. And part of living with it is trying to enhance player X mm -hmm. and two, based off of everything that comes about, using that as an opportunity to reflect on it and find out ways in which you can make even a small gain for the next time. Um, so I think when you have that, for me personally, because it ties into that earlier question, when you have that perspective and that paradigm rolling through your mind, it really alleviates it because it's almost like a can't lose type of deal, although I, I understand traditional <laughs> results for sure. Um, but if there's an evolution, whether we had, and even if you had success too, like you would do the same process. How much do you consider the fact that you are out some picks in the future, like the, the ones with the Deshaun Pitch trade, et cetera? Yeah. Like, does that play into the thinking at all as far as making the pick, trading the pick, like future planning? It, it's uh, it's a factor. You have to factor that. Um, you know, when you're not like, able to project out, well, if you do this, you'll have this level of pick. I mean, it's all, it's all part of our strategy here in the building process. What are the off-the-court intangibles that play into this pick, and how do you kind of determine those when meeting with players? Um, without getting into our full-blown yeah. thing, <laughs> things that I've talked about, like unselfishness, um, humility is a big one, uh, having a grit factor to you, BBIQ, because I've, I've, I've talked a lot a lot about that. I know that's that's on-court, off-court, but there are components that um, that really go into a growth mindset as well. You know. It, it, in, in, the, in the theme of development, you kind of have to have that. Like, you did well, you didn't do well, why, why not? What is your action to do now based off of that? So when you dig into the intel on these guys and you have a number of different re, uh, sources that, that help you out with that, you're better able to determine what that looks like for a player and project out because you're gonna need that. Like, you're gonna have to have somebody that is, is able to push through and have a growth mindset. When you bring somebody in for these workouts and they play the same position, do you work do you work them out the same way, or do you work them out like, hey, we, there's a something that might be off with that player? We want to see that in person. Uh, you, uh, we'll we'll tailor workouts more to the context of the player. For sure. Okay. Are you bringing most of these guys in, or would you travel to for these pre-draft workouts? Are they all exclusively here, or do you go travel, you know, to to wherever? To we'll, do them. we'll do both. Do both. We'll do both. Yep. Can you give us a thumbnail on on Alex Saar, kind of what you see in him? He's a good player. Projected pretty high from what I hear. Uh, you know, like has a lot of the tools that you'd want at the NBA level. Do you see in him, like I think what you hear a lot is, you know, really strong defense. You know, the offensive worry that we know is not quite there. Do you see in him the capability to, to become a you know an effective elite offensive player? I think with whether it's Saar or any other guy, you're gonna see some areas that they're gonna have to grow in. Um, so I, I, like for a guy that we bring in, I'm going to think very highly of because it's going to reach the ceiling. How unusual will it be, uh, if, assuming you keep the pick, to, uh, oh, we, if, if we're picking lower, oh, is our guy still going to be there? You know, that, you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a different headache that, that's gone away. If uh, so you're saying if we had a lower pick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in the past, you might have to say, I hope our guy is here when we pick at five or pick right. at 10 or pick at 20. Yeah. But now you don't have to worry about that. I, no, you don't. No, if you're in that situation where like, do you want to move up to try to get him? Like, there's, there's going to be different scenarios to go through. But no, like, that's the beauty of being in the number one slot. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.